midst of violent social upheaval, a voice ringing down from the mountains, a message of internal peace and the renunciation of violence. La no discriminación y la no violencia. Some hailed the rise of a new prophet, a healer. Others denounced him as a false messiah, a danger to youth, a threat to society. The Silo movement became a movement that was seen as dangerous. His followers persecuted, tortured, even killed. The press did an incredible campaign saying that we, we were having drugs, we were having orgies, we were having, I don't know, which satanic practices. His voice silenced, his words denounced and mocked. Yet somehow, this unpresupposing South American has touched lives all over the planet, from Mali to Montreal, from the poorest slums to the halls of power. Is it possible that this unknown sage really holds the key to an experience that could transform your life? He's a spiritual guide to millions of people all over the world. His ideas have given rise to movements and political parties. His social, literary, and spiritual writings have been published in dozens of languages. How is it that after all that, he remains the best kept secret of the Andes? It's a story that began many years ago in a remote outpost high in the mountains near the border of Argentina and Chile. Today, thousands have traveled from the most distant points to join Silo not far from Aconcagua, the tallest mountain in the Americas. I'm here in the crowd not only as a filmmaker, but also as one of many pilgrims from around the world who have traveled to this place where three great mountain chains converge. We have made our ways from Africa and the US, from every part of South America, from across Europe and Asia. All of this in response to Silo's message that our suffering and contradiction cause violence within us and around us. That creating internal unity ends that violence and produces the conditions for something new. Peace, force, and joy. Imagine a spirituality that's not a religion. Organizations of volunteers where no one is paid, including the leaders. An inspiration that for some has given birth to social action, for others political organization, and for many a spiritual path. Hemos peregrinado a este paraje desolado buscando la fuerza que alimente nuestra vida, buscando alegría en el hacer y buscando la paz mental necesaria para progresar en este mundo alterado y violento. For some, all of this is very new. Others have come to join old friends and colleagues. My path to this place began when I was 20 and first came across Silo's writings in a bookstore in Canada. Others have traveled farther and longer. The first time Silo spoke here, the rocky landscape was unadorned by buildings. Those who came did so at great personal risk. The first time, no one arrived in such style. The authorities were even less welcoming. The situation was more complicated and more dangerous. It may not be obvious in what a tourist might see today, but by the late 60s, Argentina was being torn apart by military dictatorship, right-wing hit squads, left-wing guerrillas, and everything in between. The cultural and political upheaval of that moment wasn't unique to South America. Riots and insurgency, revolution and protests were the reality from Malaysia to Ohio. In that overwrought environment, stories spread down from the mountains of an extraordinary young man. Drawn by curiosity or hope, guided by rumor or intuition, they sought him out, 
looking for a healer, a guru, or a guide. By 1969, Sila was living far from the centers of power in a small stone hermitage that he had constructed some miles from the outpost of Punta de Vacas. Even here, in the isolation of the mountains, the local military would often disturb his meditations by taking pot shots at him, just for fun. In the midst of the social and political turbulence, word of Silo continued to spread, and after persistent requests, he finally agreed to leave his mountain retreat and speak to a group of people in the city. Though permits were granted, the crowds were arrested before the events began. It was a pattern that repeated until it was finally announced that Silo was certainly free to speak if he wanted to speak to the rocks. He was told that he'd be welcome to return to his hermitage and speak to all the people who wanted to join him there. On May 4, 1969, the same summer humans first walked on the moon, despite the fact that it was so far off the beaten track, despite the frigid weather, despite the heavily armed soldiers, a few hundred pilgrims made their way to this distant place to hear Silo speak publicly for the first time. His words must have surprised those who came to hear a messiah or a healer. A escuchar un hombre de quien se supone se transmite la sabiduría has equivocado el camino porque la sabiduría no se transmite por medio de libros ni de arengas. La sabiduría está en el fondo de tu conciencia como el amor está en el fondo de tu corazón. The talk that Silo gave that day lasted perhaps 20 minutes. It focused on the nature of pain and suffering, the varied forms of violence, the relation between the violence inside of us and the violence around us. At the heart of it was the tale of a traveler who had lost his way, a story of suffering and pleasure, of need and desire, and the possibility of a profound change. And somehow, despite all the difficulties, his message spread by word of mouth, by flyers and posters, by every means imaginable, even as a comic book. Silo spoke here 30 years later in 1999. Aquí estamos de nuevo. It was then that the stainless steel pillar was raised to commemorate his first talk. He spoke here again in 2004, and then in 2007. But over all that time, his message has remained unchanged. Y bueno, y es la ciencia y es la justicia la que puede mejorar el dolor humano. Pero el sufrimiento humano es mental. Y el sufrimiento humano no se soluciona ni por el desarrollo de la ciencia ni por el desarrollo de la justicia. Es un esfuerzo que tiene que hacer el ser humano para entrar en otras regiones de la mente. Ese es nuestro tema. Learn to treat others in the way that you want to be treated. Learn to surpass pain and suffering in yourself, in those close to you, and in human society. Harmless stuff, you might think so, but it provoked a ferocious attack from the press, religious leaders, and the dictatorship, from the right and the left, a wave of slander and misinformation that would lead to Siloists being attacked, jailed, and even murdered. The same pattern would later be repeated in Europe and North America denounced by the media and ideologues from across the spectrum, accused both of being a cult and anti-religious, communists and fascists, members ostracized, meeting centers defaced, one in Paris was burnt down, and in the States another was bombed. In 2007, a major Cairo paper denounced Siloists as Zionists and dangerous outsiders. That short talk that irradiated from this mountain pass, heard by so few, 
provoked outrage and controversy. However, after all these years, surely we don't need to speculate. We can judge Silo's message by the fruits it's born. Learn to resist the violence that is within you and outside of you. Learn to recognize the signs of the sacred within you and around you. It was a message that would be heard in the most distant points, transforming many lives, mine among them. But none of that would happen without real risks to some of us. Among her many accomplishments as Under Secretary of State in the Chilean government, Pia Figueroa was responsible for creation of that country's first national environmental legislation. This mother of two has followed a long path to this place. I wanted the, to come here when I was 15, imagine, to hear Silo here on 1969, but I wasn't able. Not long before, a young Pia had first heard about Silo. Under the door of my house, it came a small leaflet, very small, I remember, with the image of Silo. It said, my teachings are not for the successful, are for the one, those ones that carry failure in their hearts. And I felt that that was what I had in my heart. Where the choices for change seemed to be self-absorption and drugs or armed struggle, Silo's call for nonviolent personal and social transformation touched some deeply, but went very much against the current of the times. I remember once in my friend's house, she was having the guns hidden in, uh, under her bed. I mean, that was the kind of, of, of options we were taking. Uh, maybe if I would have taken the choice of, of a violent revolution, maybe my parents would understood better. Her father's reaction wasn't surprising, considering the baseless and vicious slander accusing Silo and the Siloists of every crime from rape to murder. The Silo movement became a movement that was seen as um, dangerous. Fíjate que esa violencia siempre deriva del deseo. Cuanto más violento sea un hombre, más we of course took our time to study our issues and went to retreats or out of town to take some days to think about. We were just meditating. But the press did an incredible campaign saying that we, we were having drugs, we were having orgies, we were having, I don't know, which satanic practices. It was totally in proportion, totally um, monstrous. They was beginning to say that they kidnapped children and took them to meetings and immediately they, they began suggesting that the meetings had sexual ideas. My father, he wanted me back in home immediately. My sister followed also. She was smaller, two years younger than me, and he was desperate. I am a lawyer. I did what I was taught should be done in that case. I uh, went to the police. And she was found in one of the silos uh, meetings. The hysteria of the time meant that Pia's peaceful meditations were about to be harshly interrupted. We were in a retreat one day and an helicopter started flying and, and they stopped there, all the police and my father in the middle, saying, we go home, <laughs> girls, we are going home and we were immediately bring to Santiago and the judge started this trial, absurd <laughs> trial, and we spent five days in jail. Pia ended up in jail because her father feared that some strange cult was going to ruin his daughter's life. Subsequent events were going to prove him wrong. I think that if people were like Pia, um, we would have a very uh, nicer world, definitely. 
In this crowd are others who, like Pia, were around in those early days. Some suffered the same kind of social ostracism. Others were imprisoned or worse. Some stayed, and some, as exiles or by choice, left for Europe, Asia, and the States. After jail and after that direct confrontation with my father, I decided that this message uh, was, was enough important as to bring it to many other peoples in the world. So with some friends we organized and we went to Asia and I lived in the Philippines for a couple of years. And we published the Silos books and we formed a lot, a lot of groups and a huge movement where I met a couple of people, uh, very nice friends of mine, Victor and Cherise, who later on moved to Canada. And it was in that roundabout way that I first encountered Silo's message. I came across a sign posted by these two new Canadian immigrants. It referred to a dozen principles, tactics to creating a coherent life, principles of valid action. And then I found the book, the book these principles were taken from, The Inner Look, a kind of poetic journey from non-meaning to meaning. The very first page lets you know what you're getting into. Here it tells how the non-meaning of life is converted into meaning and fulfillment. Here is joy, love for humanity, for nature, for the spirit. Here the worldly is not placed in opposition to the eternal. Here it tells of the inner revelation, at which all arrive who carefully meditate in humble search. To me, they seemed words that held great promise. But there were also things in that book that were hard to wrap my head around. Ese es el librito que nosotros pasamos y le decimos a la gente, medite este librito, fíjese si en este librito están las cosas que a usted le resuenan como cosas importantes en su vida. Porque pronto va a salir el tema de, usted no va a estar aquí todo el tiempo, usted va a partir, todos vamos a partir, la vida se acaba en algún momento, ¿cómo sigue esta película?, ¿Es que usted termina para siempre? ¿O es que algo continúa en usted? ¿Usted quisiera tener respuesta sobre eso antes de partir? Porque partir es seguro que va a partir. But why all this talk about death? It was difficult for me to understand why something lurking in the future should be a problem today. And no wonder, we've been trained to look only to our inheritance from the past for explanations of the present. It's a proven and powerful approach. Whether it's psychoanalysis trying to explain what we are by what happened to us in our infancy, or cosmology looking back at the Big Bang to understand what our universe is like today, we expect the past to hold all the answers. Para todo, paz, fuerza, y but Silo turned it around putting the emphasis on the future. Imagine someone with a difficult past who believes that tomorrow will be great. Compare them with someone with a wonderful past who believes that everything is falling apart. And for all of us, the future holds one certainty. It will end. And if meaning has to do with the future, what then? There's no meaning if everything ends in death. What do I have that can transcend death? My reputation, my children, the actions I put in motion, or... And it's these seemingly simple questions that Silo asks us to reflect on. Do not let your life pass by without asking yourself, who am I? Do not let your life pass by without asking yourself, where am I going? For someone so focused on questions of death and transcendence, you might expect Silo to have a lot to say about God. Ese no es el tema. 
Eso es lo que le digo a la gente que cree. Que crea. Y si me dice que no cree, pues que no crea. Porque el tema es otro. El tema es otro. No es el tema de que cree en Dios o no cree en Dios. El tema es cómo soluciona sus, sus problemas existenciales. Y lo existencial no se resuelve porque crea o no crea en Dios. Our spirituality is not the spirituality of superstition. It is the spirituality that is awakened from its deep sleep to nurture the best aspirations of the human being. Believers and atheists, mystics, scientists, artists and social activists. In the wake of Silo's first public talk, a number of groups arose with their own particular interpretations of his teaching. Then in the 70s, representatives of different groups throughout the world gathered on a Greek island to study with Silo in more depth. And an organization known as the Community for Human Development began to form. And from that community, a wide range of activities. In this way, the humanist movement gradually took shape and spread as different people in different situations found common voice for the transforming personal experience they had encountered. The range of activity has varied as those people and the situations they live, denouncing violence and injustice, working for literacy or public health in Asia, the Caribbean and Africa, or organizing everything from social action to neighborhood newspapers or campaigns for better urban transit. In 1981, I joined some friends and accompanied Silo to a number of events in Europe and Asia. It seems to me that among all the extraordinary occurrences on that trip, two of the most extraordinary took place in Asia. The first was in India, on Mumbai's Chalpati Beach. One of our companions on that tour was Batandra Ayapa, a retired engineer and teacher of yoga. I remember very vividly the, the weather. Ah, oh, the weather was very bad, very bad. Uh, there was a warning that there's going to be a big cyclone and it will hit Bombay. In spite of that, we were able to gather 10,000 people at this spot. We had there, huh? The stage there. Exactly there. In the midst of that chaos, despite the storm, after speeches and talks, Silo invited those who agreed with his message to stand. 10,000 people rose to their feet, and for many, something extraordinary happened. From this very internal experience, people drew varied conclusions, interpreting the experience in different ways, with consequences that continue to play out decades later. Mukul Desai, lives a short walk from his shop in a middle-class Mumbai neighborhood. Every week for the last decade, members of his extended family gather for a meeting about Silo's message. And your attention From the beginning, from the existence of man, man has to face pain and suffering. When we do these experiences, then it gives us the power to face the challenges that are created in day-to-day -day life. Some Friday we discuss on current topics, we discuss for local problems, we discuss for our child development, we discuss for the education systems, we discuss for our personal life, family life. This makes our knowledge wider and wider and global and global. And we, we transform these to our society. Despite India's economic boom, poverty remains an enormous and extensive problem. It's not surprising then that these influences took another form in Nerunagar, one of the region's many slums. Shankar was born and still lives here with his parents, his wife, and his child. Inspired by Silo, 
He's helped transform this place. Medical started uh, last 15 years. So many medical camps, so many campaigns, uh, uh, children, education. Um, Ten years ago, there were no street lights here. Now, because of the humanist movement, there are. Our area, no lights. So now there's light. Yeah, there's an anti-malarial campaign. See, yes. It used to be that every year when the monsoon rains came, raw sewage would flood the houses. But they resolved that problem as well. All of this forms only a small part of the activities they've organized here over the last decade. This is Human Center. This last 10 years we are running so the idea is that they'll learn to sew and then they can they can actually get work sewing and earn some money and yes. support the family. Getting 100, 100 to 150 rupees, he can manage your family easily. Rukhaya Joshi is a professor of management and an important part of this project. So focus of this center where I'm associated is women and children. It's yeah. very interesting that, that this man from the other side of the world, from so far away, touched you and... and Transformed me. <laughs> and it's not just individuals that were transformed. People had lost faith in themselves in this uh, area of Nehrunaga. They had uh, lost faith that uh, any improvement can ever be done. But uh, after we started the work and after the movement started doing their activities, now almost everybody has got real faith that things can happen, change can come. These changes aren't limited to the city. Ten hours by train and another half day of driving will bring you here to Nilanga, a small farming village. Laken Joseph has invested a lot of time helping to organize humanist centers in the villages throughout the region. Like Silo and the other Siloists, he's an unpaid volunteer. They organize to see what are the problems which are faced in the villages and they work for solving those problems. First on the list was electricity, something they'd never had before. And then they organized different kind of computer centers here. On that computer centers, they try to give all the informations to the farmers. Here they also teach them how to do better farming, better organized systems, and change the costing of the farming by making new inventions into the farming. One of the most important innovations involved switching from expensive chemical fertilizers to organic farming. This would be an extraordinary story, even if it only involved this village or that slum. But it involves much, much more. Invisible to the mass media, unreported in the news, the consequences of Silo's message are transforming lives in the largest cities and in over a thousand villages in India alone. But all of that was to unfold in the years following Silo's brief visit in 1981. Back then he traveled from Mumbai to Sri Lanka for meetings with members of the Buddhist community. He also met with Sri Lanka's Prime Minister Ranasinghe Pramadasa. The meeting was civil, but the Prime Minister was unusually forthcoming. He told Silo it was pointless for a foreigner to come here and preach non-violence in this peaceful Buddhist nation. Some years later, Premadasa was assassinated and Sri Lanka continued its plunge into a violent civil war which has continued till today. But another national leader was to prove more receptive. Kenneth Kayunda was then the president of Zambia and the head of the only political party permitted under laws he himself had created. But Kayunda declared himself a humanist, and in 1989, Silo responded to repeated invitations to visit him. At that meeting, Silo insisted on the need for Kayunda to allow real democracy in Zambia. It was an encounter that Silo used as the basis for one of the stories in a collection of his tales that received an Italian literary award. But did Silo's visit 
influenced Cayunda's subsequent decision to allow free elections? He's never said so. A few years later, one of the most influential politicians of the 20th century pointed out an important convergence between Silo's writings and his own. In 1993, Silo received an honorary degree from the Russian Academy of Sciences. Four years later, Gorbachev authored a small book comparing his ideas with Silo's humanism. But what do humanism and ideas of social change have to do with this internal experience of change that Silo talks about? If you are indifferent to the pain and suffering of others, none of the help that you ask for will find justification. There are experiences that can change your life. Maybe it's something that comes to you in a dream. Maybe it's falling in love, or perhaps an unexpected insight. A veces en el campo, como acá, veo una puesta de sol. Y en esa puesta de sol, Es como si entendiera todo, por muy poco tiempo. Es entender todo, de golpe, por muy poco tiempo. Ligado a esa puesta de sol, es para mí una experiencia de cambio que puede llegar a ser muy importante. Pero yo habitualmente no saco consecuencias de eso. Todas las personas han tenido experiencias de ese tipo. Pero son muy pocas las personas que han profundizado en esas experiencias. Ahí entramos nosotros. Silo said that our experiences, even the most ineffable, don't stay in our heads. They affect what we do. We act them out in the world. Early in the 1980s, Silo's call for a change that would begin with you and your immediate environment took a truly political turn with the creation of the Humanist Party. sea un lugar que tenga un nombre violento, militar, plaza de armas. Evidentemente la gran mayoría de los chilenos aspira que En Chile, it led Thomas Hirsch to a stint as an ambassador in his country's first post-dictatorship government. Even his candidacy for president didn't really strike him as an unusual step. Yo en realidad entiendo al al humanismo o al siloísmo, es decir, a aquello que pone en marcha silo como un proyecto transformador de la sociedad, del individuo de la sociedad, y por lo mismo eh, tiene repercusión en todos los ámbitos del quehacer social. While the banners of new humanism were visible in the overthrow of dictatorship in the Philippines, and the party played a key role in the return of democracy to Chile, it's much more than a political party. Que yo siento que me va transformando a mí, pero que también comienza poco a poco a contribuir en una transformación de, del medio, y entonces me va retroalimentando porque me va dotando de sentido esa acción que vamos realizando con tantos otros en tantos lugares y que va dando frutos. Today the party is present in many regions of the world, but at the beginning of the 21st century it was to Latin America that around the world the eyes of the left were turning. And no wonder, across the continent, a new breed of politicians seem to be appearing. Nos conmovemos con el mensaje de Silo. Y nos Drawn from different parts of the political spectrum, but each of them, in some way, promising a break with the past. Among those new politicians, Evo Morales, embattled leader of Bolivia, often hailed as the country's first indigenous president. Una vez escuché su intervención que empezó a las seis de la tarde. The Latin American New Humanist Forum was preceded by a traditional ceremony at this ancient and sacred site of Bolivia's indigenous Aymara people. And among the participants was President Morales, seen as a socialist threat by many of the planet's largest business interests. But President Morales doesn't define himself in terms of the left or the right. 
un periodista me dice, ¿tú eres derechista o izquierdista? Yo digo, ni izquierdista ni derechista, sino humanista. The first of these humanist forums took place in Moscow, organized by the humanists and the Gorbachev Foundation. Later ones were held in cities from Lisbon to Dakar, and here in New York City, where the first North American forum was organized by the humanist movement and New York's Hunter College. Participants from Canada, the US, and Mexico were joined by guests from abroad. The world is absolutely uh, how do you say, interconnected, and that means that even if you don't have a problem exactly here in this place, there is a big problem in the world. It was a wide-ranging, three-day conversation about a direction for North America that went beyond the economic merger of free trade. One of the questions that I ask my kids and adults all the time is, what is our culture? That here we are, people of African ancestry. What is our culture here? The government will not listen to us when we protest. That's obvious. As the Education for Nonviolence Forum in Quebec, instead of being victimized, they organize themselves. You know, and this is very interesting. Politics, philosophy, personal change, social activism. In all of this varied activity, some say they see nothing but a chaos of changing opinions. Some of us see varied interpretations of a single vision. Nosotros que tenemos la cabeza tan cerrada, creemos siempre que la interpretación tiene que ser una. Y resulta que las interpretaciones son diversas porque son diversos los ángulos de las personas. Y eso ocurre con el lenguaje, parece que fuera cosa distinta. En realidad es la misma historia en el fondo. Son traducciones de ese mensaje. And at the heart of all this, a stillness. Deja que la fuerza se manifieste en ti. Trata de ver su luz adentro de tus ojos y no impidas que ella obra por sí sola. Siente la fuerza y su luminosidad interna. Déjala que se manifiesta libremente. Over the years, the manifestations of Silo's ideas have grown and changed. And so has this place. First a stainless steel pillar marked where he spoke so many years ago. Later, an entire complex took shape, Punta de Vacas Park, a place of meditation and meeting. And then a plan to build similar parks on every continent. But before that had barely started, national parks began to appear. Each of these parks shares the same symbolic structure. This is Parque Manantiales. This is the National Park of Chile. And this is the gateway to the park. And when you walk through the gateway, you walk into another environment. And then all the parks also have a monolith. Its form has to do with historically how the human being has always built that, which is something to do with the connection of the heavens with the earth and, and then we also have a fountain underground springs waters it has to do with life in itself and then it's a stele which is like a little monument with all the names of the people who have helped build the park because our parks are put together just by people and then we have the halls and they're purposely made without any distraction. And in our halls, what you find are other people or empty space. And so the two situations are the best situations to reflect or to have internal experience. And our parks are open for everyone. Call it a park or an ashram as they do in India. The names change, but the substance remains the same. We have the monolith at that end. Oh, there, the monolith will be there. 
utility room uh, this thing section will be on the other side. Some are regional parks, like this one in India, Red Bluff in California, Atiliano in Italy. Others are national parks, like Manantiales in Chile, and Spain's Toledo Park. Lareja in Argentina is the national park for South America. Today, the park in Lareja, just outside of Buenos Aires, is filled with people enjoying this beautiful May afternoon. Trees and grass, instead of desert or mountains, but the familiar gate, hall, monolith, fountain, and of course the same atmosphere, the same spirit. And at the heart of that spirit, what is the nature of this experience that we keep hearing about? An experience that it said can, independent of your beliefs, lead to profound internal peace unlimited vital force, and a joy that can withstand life's inevitable difficulties. And the man who initiated all of this? Well, if you think spirituality is only about religion, or if you think wisdom should be all warm and fuzzy, you may be looking in the wrong place. If you're expecting someone wrapped in robes, gesturing slowly and talking softly of love, you may be looking for the wrong sage. This one's from a small South American town. You could pass him in a crowd and never think twice. He doesn't float above the ground or drive around in a golden limo. On the other hand, in all these years, he's never charged for his teachings or his time. He lives a pretty normal life, family and the family dog. Nothing very fancy, but it's a warm home full of friends and laughter. A simple human being like the rest of us. Well, certainly in some ways. Voy a la chacarita, al desarmadero, a buscar unos caños de petróleo para el parque. But he's someone who, while ignored, ridiculed, and persecuted over the years, has nonetheless touched many people very deeply, despite the differences in their cultures, economic status, and ways of life. Pero yo, como un tipo con timores y angustias, ¿Qué yo puedo hacer? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo yo puedo...? Tú tienes que basarte en una experiencia que te cambie, que te abra el horizonte. Sin esa experiencia vas a estar dando vueltas en el mismo círculo vicioso. Y nosotros es de lo que hablamos, de esa experiencia transformadora en el ser humano. Que te saque del miedo, que te saque del temor, que te saque del futuro cerrado, que te abra un horizonte... And who is this strange man who presumes to tell us what we need? Ni quita ni pone. Es una persona común. Y si el tema está en cómo puede hacer uno para salir de los problemas del sufrimiento, del dolor, de todas esas cosas que no tiene cómo superar. ¿Y qué, qué importa que soy yo? ¿Por qué mensaje o experiencia puede ser suficiente? ¿Por qué pensamiento de persona real puede realmente creer que las cosas ever ser diferentes? Who's naive enough to believe that fears, hate, and anger can ever end? Who can doubt that death is anything but the final defeat? This chain of actions that was set in motion in life cannot be stopped by death. I've always felt that Silo throws down a kind of challenge, challenging me to doubt the conventional wisdom challenging me to ask myself, but what if it is possible? What if I can change? What if everything can change? How would I act then? What would I do differently? And if we continue to fail in these impossible aspirations, well, as Silo says, though you may be wise and powerful, if happiness and liberty do not grow in you and those around you, I will reject your example. Accept instead my proposal, Follow the model of that which is being born, 
not that which takes the path to death. Do not imagine that you are alone in your village, in your city, on earth, or among other infinite worlds. No imagines que estás encadenat a aquest temps i a aquest espai. Un palat ni so de ve, diga ve, tu ve, per favor. Mucha gente en ese, ese momento que tiene una sensación bastante apocalíptica, que cosas van muy mal. ¿no? ¿Qué te dice? Parece que todo se cayera. Se caen instituciones, se caen formas políticas. Seguramente está muy bien que se caiga, pero en las personas no. Está surgiendo un nuevo sentido, una cosa muy importante. Están aspirando a otro tipo de mundo. Así que creo que... Vamos bastante bien y nada de apocalipsis. Eso no es así. Mm.